heard about her first when I was a little girl myself. Um, when we um, dressed for our Holy Communion, we wore the white dress and the veil. And I remember my father saying to me, oh, you look like little Nellie. And we were very annoyed because that name didn't suit at all. So we used to say, no, leave us alone. Don't say that. But I did hear about her. She was called Little Nellie of Holy God. And I knew that she was buried in Cork City in the graveyard of a, the orphanage where she died. She cropped up again. When I came working here, we were going and um, doing some training and the tour guide brought us along and he paused at a house here and he said, little Nellie lived here. And I said, oh, I remember her. To be honest, I don't say this much to people, but I started working here in 2012, and in 2014, I was passing Little Nelly's house, and I did get some sort of, I don't even know how to describe it, but definitely some sort of an experience. I found it hard to move. I did not see anything, but definitely I, I could not hear the water. And then I, Virgin Mary flashed into my mind. And quickly after that, the Vir, or Little Nelly flashed into my mind. And then I, I, I could hear her again and everything was okay. And then I said, okay, I must do research into this girl. And every time I tried to do research and I was finding it hard, something would happen. For an example, I would pick up a paper and something about Little Nelly would be there. So I then started praying to her and saying, Little Nelly, I'm finding it very hard to find your story, but please, if you want me to be able to do this, please help me. And the next morning I could get a phone call from a nun saying, hi, I've got some information. I now have a relic belonging to Little Nelly too. And during my journey for the last two years, I think it's even making me stronger as a Catholic too. A lot of the tourists on Spike Island, when I tell them my story, they'd say, well, we think that Little Nelly wanted you to do this. And I actually feel that now because I'm very close to Little Nelly every day. And anybody that's sick or anyone that's having trouble, I always either bring them here or else I bring them to Little Nelly's grave as well. And they're finding great peace there as well. Spike Island, it's an island in Cork Harbour. Now Cork Harbour is the second biggest natural island or harbour in the world. And Spike Island has a vast history. You had a monastery here. The um, evidence for that is in the lives of the saints. And it was said that a saint, um, Makuda, or Saint Carthage, who is a well-known monster saint, in his description of his life, it is said that he founded a monastery here. And then he went on to found found monasteries in um, other parts of the south of Ireland and he became a bishop. So the Irish for bishop is Aspig and the name of this island is derived from that because it's called Inish on Aspig which is the island of the bishop and it then when you say Inish on Aspig and you say Spig come becomes Spike. It has strands of history then. It was a military installation and it was used as a prison. It was built by the British who owned this island and they were defending themselves against Napoleon at the time. They fortified the whole harbour because it's a, it was a very important harbour to the British because it, they had their naval base here and so many assets here. They built this fort between 1800 and 1860. But then in 1847, they used it as a base for putting people who were convicted of crimes and they were being deported. So there was up to 2,400 convicts here at its highest level. So it was probably one of the biggest prisons in the British Empire at the time. But deportation stopped then in 1863 
and it was then used as a prison for sentences. And they, some of the worst prisoners were brought here because they had to do solitary confinement and hard labour. And the hard labour was here because they used the prisoners here to finish building the fort and also to go across to Hall Boland where the naval base was and do work over there. And so it, it stopped being a prison then in 1883. And, but it was a prison again in the time of the War of Independence here. In 1921, this held up to a thousand internees and political prisoners. And later on, it became a prison again. Its third iteration, we'll say, when it was used to house, we'll say, young offenders. And they were held here from 1985 to 2004, which is quite recent. When they left, the island in 2004 became derelict and it was just kept kind of, um, you know, volunteers came over and they kept, kind of kept it from just falling apart altogether. And the, the, the council took it over then and they made a big plan to renovate it and turn it into a heritage site. The reason why Little Nelly's family came here was, it's called Mary Quarters. So back then, if your father was in the army, the wife and the kids were allowed to live here. So because of her father being in the British Army, they were allowed to live on the island. Her father's name was William Organ. Her mother was Mary Ahern. They got married, they had four kids. They had Thomas, David, Mary Jr. And then lastly, they had Ellen, E-L-L-E-N, Ellen Organ. Or anybody in Ireland call Ellen was automatically called Nelly. It's just an Irish thing. Little Nelly was born in Waterford City in an army barracks. Her father was a soldier and at that time they were under the British Empire and the only way a lot of men could get regular work was to join the British Army. When he joined the British Army, a couple of months later his wife got a disease called TB and it was suggested to him that he transfer to Spike Island because the fresh air would be very good for his wife for her lungs and stuff, so they did. And they all arrived here on Spike Island in 1905. On Spike Island, here in Cork, in Ireland, Little Nelly first said that she was having some sort of communication with Jesus in some way. And because of her age, she wasn't believed but she know, knew so much about religion that within the next four or five months, this girl could say prayers. She knew Jesus' life story. She longed to get her Holy Communion. She knew so much. And then I think uh, my personal opinion on this would be on my research is that she's now claiming a few months later to have some sort of a second communication. And there she's saying that, you know, Jesus had said to her in some way, I know you're suffering a lot of pain and I will fly you to heaven with me on Holy God's Day, which is a Sunday. And she did actually die on a Sunday. Unfortunately, the mother never made it, and she died. She died in the house, and she's buried in Cove by herself. Now, when um, her mother died, William, he kind of found, that, found it hard to raise the four kids by himself, do the work up here as a soldier, and especially for Nellie, because Nellie never once complained, but in my research I've done, I know she suffered a lot of pain every single day, because she had a disease in her spine, and then she had a disease in her jaw. It was so advanced that, you know, her jaw just fell apart just before she died. Unfortunately, because there was no mother there to look after the kids and they were so young, it was suggested that, you know, the kids should be properly looked after. So the father put all the kids into an orphanage. So the two boys were separated to different orphanages, but little Nelly and her sister Mary left Spike Island here and they were taken to the Good Shepherds Convent up in Cork City in Sunday as well, and it was run by the Good Shepherds nuns. I 
I'm from London, but I'm from an Irish community in London. And I married a man from Cork. So I came here to live 11 years ago. And um, a friend of mine from London had great devotion to little Nelly. And she also had relatives from Cork. And that's how she got to know about little Nelly. And she said to me, Kate, you're here in Cork to spread devotion to little Nelly. And I thought she was mad. I read about little Nelly, I saw the pictures. The pictures of little Nelly, she comes across as suffering, and she was suffering a lot. And it was very difficult for me to look at a child who was suffering because I am actually a nurse and I could see the pain in her face. But I've read so many about other children with, who have devotion to the Eucharist. But um, it was one day, I bought two books on Little Nelly for a priest and a friend in London and I put them in my handbag and a flight going from court to London was delayed for two or three hours and I had nothing else to read. So I started reading about Little Nelly and um, by the end of it I found myself crying and crying and crying and I felt that our Lord wanted devotion to Little Nelly. Little Nelly and her sister went to this convent, which we see behind us, called the Good Shepherd's Convent. She was brought up with the faith with her mother to teach the rosary. She was taught the rosary with her mother, and um, she loved going to Mass. So when she came to this convent, already the faith was instilled in her, and she had strong devotion. When Little Nelly went up to this place, she had to be physically examined because that's what happened to kids back then. And they discovered now that she had this disease in her jaw, but they also discovered she had TB. I think she got it from her mum because it was furry contagious. So when little Nelly went to the Good Shepherds, she was confined to the hospital all the time. Now I've been up to her room many times and it's a big building. So down one corner would be the little Nelly's bedroom in the hospital and away up the corridor would be the church. So now, I don't want to say that the nuns were playing tricks in her because they weren't, but they wanted to know, was this really happening or was it all in her mind because she was so young? So every single day, 12 nuns would go away up the other side to Mass. Eight of them would receive the Eucharist and four would not. Little Nelly then asked them to come back and visit her and she was hugged them and kissed them because she said this was the closest to Jesus she could get. But in the meantime, she was saying, why didn't you go to communion today? I know you didn't. I know you did. You didn't either. She never got it wrong. And she couldn't have known this. So now the nuns believed her. And then shortly afterwards, she gets another communication with Jesus. And this time Jesus apparently says to her, I am now ready to take you to heaven with me, but you must get your Holy Communion first. So they faced a big problem in Ireland because the age for Holy Communion was 11 and 12. She yearned, yearned and yearned to um, receive the Eucharist. It was the greatest torment, more than the pain, was not receiving the Holy Eucharist. She exhibited a spiritual knowledge way beyond her years, or, or even her education would have not given her that. And the nuns noticed this, and they notified the Bishop of Cork about this, and he came to visit her on many occasions. The Bishop of Cork, his name was O'Callaghan, he would have sent the report over to Pope Pius X. Now, I do know that the Pope read this report only once, and he put the report on the table, 
and he said, I believe everything this little girl is saying. She is so advanced in religion. Nobody was teaching her this. So special permission was given to her and she got her Holy Communion in December 1907 and she died on a Sunday, like she said, on the 2nd of February 1908. It was a grace from God that this four-year-old could understand so deeply Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. She longed to receive Jesus so much that the nuns who were adults were amazed at the faith of this little child and they knew there was something very special about her. And that's why they applied to the Pope in Rome to get a special dispensation before she died to receive Jesus in the Eucharist and he granted it. So this is not something ordinary, this is something extraordinary that the grown women, the nuns, could see something very, very special in this child, the longing, the desire to receive Jesus. We all want to receive Jesus, of course, but some people have a special, special grace that they, they just they see Jesus in the Eucharist as if he was standing there, which is the way it is, but it can be difficult for us at times to, to appreciate that. She was the first child to have been given First Holy Communion at that age. 12 was the normal age for, for children to receive Holy Communion and was reduced based on her example from 12 down to 7. So she would have been the first child to have brought that into effect in the world. The terrible knuckle is behind me. This is the original one. So when that, that special day, you can just imagine how happy this girl must have been. At last she knew she was getting her communion. So the Holy Communion was actually in this. And the Holy Communion, the, the bread was taken from here and given to little Nelly. She was very happy and, and that's an incredible thing to think of a girl so young that suffered so much pain. She was still happy. She did say that she loved Spike Island because when she looked out her window she saw the moon reflecting on the water and with the waves she said the moon was dancing on the water. But I do know her best life was here on Spike Island because when she went to the convent she started to get sick. But when she was in the convent, I do believe that she played a tin whistle and she had a pet cat, a black cat. When my first times I went to see Little Nelly's room, which is very dialect at the moment, I can't go into her room because there's no floor and fall through. But I got to the top of the stairs and I saw a cat just on the windowsill, pure black. And I had done my research and she said she used, there used to be a black cat there with her too. But the nuns were very good to her and they knew that she was very special. Little Nelly held a cross at the age of four years and said, poor holy God, a oh, poor holy God. And she um, became unconscious at three o'clock, beginning of the hour of mercy, and died at four o'clock, which was later revealed to Sister Faustina of Poland, that the hour of divine mercy. And little Nelly died at four o'clock on the feast of the presentation of Jesus the child Jesus. When she dies, they bury her in just a normal public cemetery in Cork. It's called St. Joseph's in Ballyfehan in Cork. But 12 months to 18 months after her death, You've got people from all of the places coming to visit this grave because the Pope is considering lowering the age because of this girl. So he, he was inspired by this girl and they wanted to know more about her. But in the meantime, when people were coming to visit her grave, people were leaving walking sticks because they were claiming miracles. So it was a public cemetery. So the Catholic Church, especially the nuns, they asked for permission to exhume her body and bring her back to the convent and bury her in the convent grounds. And permission was given, but also, especially Pope Pius X, he lost for uh, an inspection of her body because he believed she was very special, so they did. So around, again, between 12 and 18 months after her death, 
the exhumer body and they open her coffin and she doesn't decompose in any way. In fact, we have the photograph over here and I do know that her jaw was disfigured because of this disease. So straight away, this alerted the church. And when Pope Pius heard about her being incorrupt, he said, this is one of the signs of a sainthood. Now I do believe that Pope Pius wanted to start something back then, around 1909, to make her a saint in the future, but he died halfway through, and I think that's the reason why she's not a saint today. Now for me, I've been talking to nuns in Waterford, and they told me that last year they were in the Vatican, and Pope Francis has been talking about this girl, and they said yes, she will be a saint in the future. Little Nelly, her religious beliefs, her strong religious and spiritualness was always to Jesus. It's because she claims that she had communication with him and she loved Jesus so much that when she was asked, what do you think happens when you get your Holy Communion? She simply said, I will get Jesus on my tongue and he will go down into my heart. Jesus told us himself that he was going to leave us himself and when he was leaving the disciples in John's gospel as well he speaks a lot about the, the bread that he is the bread of life that he will give himself to us and we know it if you ever go through a time in your life when you don't receive the Eucharist it is very very different we receive so many graces it's an extraordinary privilege that God has given us that we can receive him the catechism of the Catholic Church tells us that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith it's everything and so it is very sad then when people turn away from receiving Jesus in the Eucharist because they are losing out on so much. And this We call it Holy Communion, of course, this Holy Communion between ourselves and God. It is, it is unbelievable. And so God gives us people like little Nelly to help us, to remind us, just like the Eucharistic miracles, you know. They happen every now and again for us to be reminded of the presence of God in the Eucharist and for us to be more reverent and respectful, to prepare ourselves. So it's a wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us, the gift of himself. And Jesus said, I will stay with you after I go. And this is how he stays with us most profoundly. Your great Saint Faustina said, if the angels could envy, which they can't because the angels are all good and envy is a bad thing, they would envy us for two things. One is to be able to suffer because through, the, through our suffering we show our love for God by the acceptance of it. But the second is to receive the Eucharist. We don't appreciate it as human beings, but God gives us special people like little Nelly to help us to come to a greater appreciation of it. There was a gospel where Jesus came down from the mountain and the people ran to him when they saw him. There's Jesus, they ran to him. And we should be the same to go into the church to see Jesus there. The newly canonized saint in Portugal, in Fatima, Francesco, one of the, the children of Fatima, had this extraordinary gift like little Nelly. He just wanted to spend time with Jesus all the time in the church and to console him. And so we should pray for this grace in our own lives, that we come to a deeper appreciation of God's presence in the Eucharist, that God Almighty himself is there in the church waiting for us, hoping that we will come in and just spend some time with him. We don't even have to say anything. The great Curie of ours is supposed to have said to a man who he would see sitting for hours just looking at the tabernacle every day and the Curie of ours said to him, what do you say to God? And he said, I say nothing. I look at him, he looks at me. A beautiful relationship. And little Nelly's faith was, of course, that of a four-year-old. But that's what Jesus tells us, that we must have childlike faith and believe like this four-year-old child. So it's tremendously profound and we learn so much from little Nelly to help us in our own faith journey. She was uh, touched by spirituality, definitely. But what message you actually take from that into a modern world, I'm, I'm not quite sure. 
I think it's, it's a shame that we are losing our religion, uh, our, our spiritual beliefs here in Ireland, that parents no longer bring their children to church, that first communions and confirmations are really a, a kind of a showcase for videos and for days out, but the actual spiritual meaning of those occasions are getting lost more and more. I think that's regrettable here in Ireland. And um, the fact that the abortion has been approved uh, I have serious uh, reservations about that as well, particularly in regard to the fact that a woman can demand an abortion up to 12 weeks, and that is uh, killing of a live person in the womb, and I think that's very regrettable. See, little Nelly, we can we mustn't over sentimentalise her. She was very, very real. She was very real of the things of God and very real of things of the world. A nurse asked little Nelly, I thought you was going to go to Holy God. She said, I'm not good enough to go to Holy God yet. So it teaches us that we have to be prepared. She knew that and she actually prophesied, she said that when I die, I'll be wearing my first communion dress, my first Holy Communion dress, at the age of four years and five months. Maybe preparing herself for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And when she died, she was truly, truly ready to meet God, because 18 months later, her body was exhumed and it was intact. There is a lot of people that I have talked to claiming miracles. I will tell you one if I have time. In 1985, in Cork, there was a family who got married. Uh, a year later, they had a baby. The baby was very, very sick. The baby never left the hospital. And on a Friday, the mother and father left the hospital to go home to get some rest. Friday evening, they came back. They were all called into the consultant's room with the bad news that their baby son was going to die, that he was going to die in the next couple of hours. And the uh, doctor said, all you can do is just comfort your child and stay with him. Now this man lives up close to Sunday as well and he's a very devoted man to little Nelly. So he said to me, I shouldn't have done what I did John, but I did. So he wrapped his son in a blue blanket and left the hospital. He put the baby on little Nelly's grave with his wife and his mother-in-law and they said prayers for what he told me 30 minutes. He brought the baby back to the hospital and I met that child last year. His name was Christopher. He's around 32, 33 now. He's perfect. But I do know there's other people in the world claiming mir bigger miracles as well. So I, I do know, I, and I have all this in writing from the people. We need her so much because she, she represents the suffering, the sick child, the child has devotion to the Eucharist. She was um, consecrated to our Blessed Mother. She said her morning prayers, her evening prayers. We need her so much to intercede for Ireland to help us understand that children are sacred from the moment they're conceived and we must protect their innocence and their purity. Which often happens that the time she lived in was not the time that she was to affect. She died age four and many people would not have known her, but after she died, the Holy Spirit is inspiring people to, to pray to have this child uh, become a saint. And when she does become a saint, because I think, you know, it's quite clear that the Holy Spirit is at work here with all the devotion and the involvement people have, that when she does become a saint, please God, it will be for the time to inspire people to a deeper appreciation of their faith and especially God's presence in the Eucharist.